Hi, Reality Riffing. I got the great pleasure of interviewing club superstar and com- complete maverick and legend, Peter Gation. He just wrote an amazing book called The Club King, which I highly recommend reading. He's actually a really incredible writer. And every project he's ever worked on since his first business, uh, uh, where, where he opened a jean store, has been just an overnight success. I mean, nothing's an overnight success, but almost. And, and he details some of that. That he just has been at the center of culture and culture creation in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and really the, the last mythos of nightlife that has happened. As, and he kind of describes what his opinion around what's happened in nightlife since social media and since some of the other types of more financially driven ways that clubs are run now and how much that's taken from the actual uh, egalitarian club experience. And um, I grew up in uh, DC, in the DC and Baltimore club life in the 90s. Um, and of course, always looked at the limelight and, and the tunnel and some of his, his other clubs as being kind of the epitome of where all culture was coming from at that time. I was really interested in sitting down with Peter for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that part of my mission is to create a new era of what it means to be celebrating, to party, to be in community, to create culture and what that looks like in this new era. And that was one of the most exciting things of really picking Peter's brain about what it, what it could look like, what is missing and how we really create culture in this new era in 2020. So I hope you enjoy this riveting conversation with Peter Gation. Incredibly uh, excited to uh, have Peter Gation on the show today. Um, your career and just the, uh, the spectrum of experience and, and what you've done for um, so many layers of pop culture and um, thought leadership is really impressive. And thank you for being here. Happy to be here. Um, as I was teasing you before, uh, your daughter comes to class and, um, when I realized I moved to New York city in 1999, so I kind of just missed, missed it. I just missed it, but, um, grew up in, in kind of the, 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 it being the, uh, limelight and tunnel being kind of the epitome of, of, um, club life in, in, you know, our, our small clubs in DC and, and Baltimore. So, um, was really excited to meet your daughter and then uh, hear about her work. And then there's she's been- great, yeah. She's a really great person. She's an amazing person. Congratulations. You did a great job. Another mm-hmm. another great creation. Um, so I, 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 you have this new book out uh, called The the Club King, and um, it's, a, it's an incredible retrospective. And um, I was very much touched by the uh, beginning where you talk about Jen finally convincing you to do ayahuasca ceremony and um she, she was persistent i gotta tell you you know took a couple of years of like you know finally putting a line in line in the sand and saying you're going or and the or wasn't you know i i couldn't deal with it so anyway um yeah yeah, yeah. was was that the, was that the only one you did was that enough no, no well i mean she, she Listen, we're really close, and, and she expressed on one, one occasion, "Dad, you've got to try this." And, and you know, I'm, I'm I've experimented, in, you know, with uh, hallucinations and, and everything else, you know, you know, which I admit to in the book. So, yeah, it, it was uh, it was one of those things where she was persistent, and, and I, obviously, I really value her opinion. So this wasn't just coming from you know somebody that I didn't respect, you know, uh, in all ways. So when she she, you know, she was, but she was persistent, and you know. It's, in my sixties at the time, and uh, you know, a little resistant to, you know, trying it, but uh, I was really happy that I did. It was a really wonderful experience. I didn't learn once, though. Yeah, 
Do you feel like uh, your it opened something for you in terms of your ability to kind of see a, a heightened perspective? Or a w- yeah, I, I mean, it was a voy. I, I describe it as a voyage. It took me. It was like watching a movie of my own life, and it's really like watching a movie where you can go back to when you're five six years old, six years old, to whatever episode, and you can see the clothes that you're wearing, the little shirt, the little pants. That it, it's really. Um, it was really an experience that. I've encouraged people that I know that can handle it. It's not that, you know, it's, it's one of, it, it's, it's, it's a strenuous voyage, but um, I think it's great. Like I, I loved it. I think I, I, what I uh, love in terms of uh, your work and, and uh, so much of what you've um, given to the planet and, and something that I think is very interesting. I'm curious your take on this is that, the spiritual experience, uh, it, my mission is to really redefine what the spiritual experience looks like. And right. um, part of, of if you weren't there or you, you didn't have the experience of um, what was happening in the club culture in the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, I think it, it's it, this is a place where uh, the the spiritual experience existed in a whole nother kind of form and i'm curious your your well i, I think anytime large groups of people assemble and party and laugh and dance and whatever it's contagious it really is, it is. And, and you you know you can't you can only you know you're not only but it, it just feels a lot better when there's large masses of people there all basically feeling the same energy, the same spirit, that you have the same exuberance, the same happiness. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very contagious. And it's, it's you know, um, people remember those nights. You know, most people remember their nights in the line later, the tunnel or Club USA or, or Palladium as being, you know, not the high point, high point of their life, but you know, definitely points that are, you know, that are remembered with, with nostalgia and remembered with, with fondness and, you know, happiness or whatever. Um, but I think anytime you know large groups congregate um, and basically dancing and celebrating to the same vibe that's going on to it, it's it's very you know uh, it's very terrific. Yeah, and and now we can think we can look back with nostalgia on on any groups gathering <laughs> to yeah. do anything. <laughs> yeah, I think it's gonna be you know it's gonna be a few years and and, and whether even like you know just the momentum of of the whole large gatherings or whatever just I, I yeah i don't think it's going to be disappear i mean yeah i'm an optimist person i always think listen people have been dancing and partying for thousands of years that you know it's not going to stop now no but the uh you know i i think i you know, try to explain in the book you know the whole club experience is, is really transformed over the years I felt like I did it in the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, and it was basically a you know, fashion change and music change and style change, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, we were sort of like, we were the social media of social media before social media sort of transformed the world. I mean, if you want to know what people are wearing, you want to know, you know, uh, uh, you know see what, you know, new styles, you know, be ahead of the music curve for stuff that may hit the radio in a year's time, you know, all that kind of stuff was being played in, in, in clubs, whether we did fashion shows or book parties or photographer shows or whatever. I mean, we were the social media. We were the ones that basically spread uh, spread the culture. And that's, you know, I, and, and, and in the book, again, I, I emphasize, like I used to tell my staff all the time, we're here for one reason only, and that's create culture. It's like, you know, uh, we have to make it financially sustainable. Right. Uh, but it's not like, let's, you know, bang everybody out for as much money as we can in a year or two and then, you know, move on to another, you know, spot or whatever uh, my clubs had uh, almost two decade runs, and quite frankly, if it wasn't for Giuliani and his yeah. quality of life and, and you know Tracy campaign on me, uh, the clubs would yeah probably still be there if we were putting the effort into them. Yeah, it took a lot of yeah. The uh, I'm I'm curious what you think of. Um, I agree with you. I think we're actually going to have a huge swing back. Uh, I think the digital life that we're being forced to live now is going to swing back into in real life experience more than ever. That's my prediction. Um, I hope you're right. I I I you know I really feel like that is there has to be a swing of the pendulum and people are being pressurized and and I think it's going to like require people to show up more in person than they ever have that's my that's my little prediction on this particular thing that I, you know, 
like the, you know, what I like most about those days is you had to go out, you had to communicate yeah. with people, not sit in your basement and find like-minded people on, on an app or whatever. Right. I mean, you had to put energy into it. Yep. Yep. And uh, I think that 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 this is. I mean, again, it, it, you, we'll see. It's we live on a polarity planet, so um, we'll see. We'll see how it, it goes. But um, I do think that there's going to be there's going to be a major kind of swing into something that, that you know is uh, maybe something we haven't experienced in the club culture in more recent years. I mean, what's your yeah, what's your take on what's been happening in the club culture? I mean, every time I I, I Oh, yeah, a lot of it. Listen, it's transformed. Like I said, it was basically the same in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, other than music, video, fashion, art, and, and players, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But with, with social, yeah, with, with social media sort of coming on board, that helped, I think, helped or hurt, or, you know, accelerated sort of the, the end of the golden years of nightclubs. Right. It's just like, um, and then there was, you know, overzealous law enforcement like what happened in New York City and then you know real estate values you know you got to throw in you know money in there somewhere too They're just the real estate interest in Manhattan over the last 20 years have been priority one right yeah you know, a couple of weeks ago I was talking to a friend of mine who has a smaller club in, in New York and we're talking about you know employees and when I had my clubs in the 80s and 90s in New York I'd say 80 percent of my staff lived in Manhattan, you know, whether they lived on Avenue A, B, or C, or they lived in the village, or they lived on, right. even First Avenue was affordable, et cetera, et cetera. It tells me now that none of us, like zero of employees live in Manhattan, because it's unaffordable. So that whole creative community, the art movement was happening in the 80s or 90s with Basquiat and, and Warhol and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's just, it's not there in New York anymore. It's just, right. Right, at least, you know, you know the, what, this moved somewhat to Brooklyn, and a lot of, quite frankly, has moved to L.A., because, um, yeah. you know, community just couldn't afford the uh, the sticker price in New York anymore. Yeah, it's true. I mean, who would have thought I moved to LA in 2000 two, three. And at the time it was very not in vogue for me to do so. None of my New York friends could understand, but um, I, I, I would have never thought that LA was going to become the epitome of any culture, um, but it kind of has and, and is, um, which is, is kind of bizarre. But um, uh, so I'm uh, very curious about, well, I was just reading something that Hunter S. Thompson, it was kind of, I was looking at, uh, I like to read Hunter S. Thompson's eulogy of Nixon, you know, at least once a week, just to inspire myself. Um, And he was in some interview, he was talking about, um, he was talking about the advent of the internet, and it was kind of around the same time, um, the advent of the internet and how he got an email address and, you know, that he was never going to check it. And it was just interesting to hear him say, you talk about and it was very much kind of what we're talking about now is this yeah. this shift in a, such a massive shift in cultural perspective into yeah. this digital age that we're living very deeply in now i think the change a lot in the club world besides social media i would say effect on real estate you know values is that the whole industry sort of transformed at the end of the 90s where this whole bottle service concept came in and, and customers were valued on the basis of what they could spend. Like if you could pop a thousand dollars for a bottle right. for a table and that kind of stuff. Where in our day it was much more egalitarian where right. we actually valued our customers on what you contributed to the party, whether you put a little a little effort in your outfit, where you're a little bit of sequenced here, whether you know, a little better sense of style in that kind of stuff. You were rewarded with, you know, getting in. We didn't ask you, okay, how much you know, you're spending tonight, or here's just, you know, a booth that's going to cost you a thousand. It, you know, it, it, our our focus was on getting as much of an eclectic crowd, which meant the representation representation of New York City that was all colors, all creeds, all sexual preferences, yeah. you know, that sort of stuff. Those days are over now. Like I said, you know, the, the sort of hotter places are bottle clubs that. Uh, there'll be there'll never be a legacy out of those places because they just don't create culture. No, it's, it's, you know, no. it was much more egalitarian uh, twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. Interesting. I, I as an entrepreneur, well, just love your story as an entrepreneur, and um, I would well, love the for highlights you. of it. <laughs> the low light. No, not, not the low parts of it. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, but there's always low part. I mean, that's that's being an entrepreneur, um, uh, and I think it's. Yeah, but, you know, Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, my uh, my fall was pretty uh, pretty harsh. Yeah, um, yeah. But anyway. I, I, you know, I'm curious. You didn't you you lightly touched or kind of the book kind of ended um, uh, with. 
how that ricocheted into, you know, um, your life. I mean, I'm, I'm very curious about that. I want to talk about your life as an entrepreneur, but like how, what, what tools, what did you do uh, to kind of pick the pieces back up or not? I and mean, what, what, what happened after? Yeah, after yeah, first, when I got deported, it, it, you know, that was like the final body blow. And, and, and you know, that was one where it took me a long time to lick my wounds. Like, you know, I, I'd been, grew up in the fifties, small border town, uh, you know, watched, you know, part of the culture back then was watching, you know, uh, Sunday night TV shows with, you know, with the world of Disney where you saw Cinderella's castle and, mm-hmm. so, you know, and, and, you know, there's always shows where there was father knows best or, or leave it to beaver or whatever, you know, sort of like perfect families and, and you know, monies were never concerned and everything like that. So I, I had a, you know, a real strong desire to move to the USA as a youngster, especially in a small town. I mean, Ryson's a small town. If you went to university, you become a doctor, a lawyer, accountant. If you just completed high school, you worked at the local mill. And if you didn't right. complete high school, you dug ditches. Okay. Yeah. Those were the Ryson's. There's no like graphic artists. And it was, you know, there's, there was, you know, designers. There's none of those kind of opportunities. So, I was always infatuated with the United States and, you know, especially, you know, view it as in the fifties and sixties. And, you know, it was like the land of milk and honey. And, and yeah. to me, like watching Cinderella's castle was like, you know, I got to go there someday. And, you know, in my mind was like on the other side of the moon. Right. It wasn't like I could tell they dad, you know, why don't we go to Walt Disney World next year? They would have, you know, had me go see a doctor or something wrong with this kid. Like you just wouldn't have that, you know, that thought in your mind. Right. So the, um, the deportation, once I got deported here, um, first couple of years I was here by myself. And, and I, I, to be honest with you, I had almost be a PSTD. Uh, it was like I, I was uh, I was mentally in a, a really, really dark place. Um, Jennifer actually had my dog sent up and, and I, you know, I spent like two years with the dog that was like you know my best friend for those mm-hmm. couple of years. So yeah, it was difficult. Yeah. I eventually, uh, I did open a club up, um, but unfortunately I had partners that were guys that, in the mid forties, it still want to act like we're 20 years old and, and whatever. So after the first year I left, but the club made was not, was, was nominated for best super club. You know, one, not only not one best super club at the Miami club awards, you know, and that's competing with Mexico, South America, you know, uh, Vegas, wow. you know, uh, European clubs or whatever. Um, so, you know, I did it one more time and, and it was very successful, you know, other than after I left, you know, um, and then for the last few years, truthfully, um, we, we live a modest life, um, comfortable life, um, but it's, it's, it's been difficult. And then organically sort of things happen at the same time. Uh, Jen was pitching a, um, a movie to Amazon. They didn't, they just said it wasn't for her. What else are you working on? So I'm working on my dad's story and just so happened to have the press book that we have there. That's like, you know, almost a foot thick. And she left it with him. And 10 minutes later, they called her up and said, you know, uh, we want this. Don't go anywhere else. We want to do this movie. So that's in the works now. And then uh, the book, uh, obviously, I, I was on that for the last two years, a year and a half. It takes a while to write a book, especially it if you're not a professional. It does. Um, and uh, now, you know, and Jen and I are also working on a, a documentary about Tunnel Sundays, the, the, the you know, famous hip hop night there. Yeah. It's a director called Sasha Jenkins, um, who did Wu-Tang. Uh, series that was just on Netflix. Yeah. But anyway, you know, we have some good projects going. Yeah, yeah. So you're busy. Busy enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's something that you talk about in the book, which I certainly um, experience, and I think I think any uh, kind of high risk uh, nervous system entrepreneur understands this restlessness that you get. Um, when you when you're when you have that kind of entrepreneurial we'll call it it, it could be diagnosed as a mental illness um, that entrepreneurial uh, spirit in right. mind um, I'm, I'm curious I mean do, are you still experiencing that do you still have that kind of no, 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 at this point in my life listen if, if I you know I get these three projects done you know, and I, I may even write another book I'm not sure but I think you should I'm just gonna put my uh, opinion in there you know, I, I read a lot about politics and, and, and different you know I got my own theories on, you know, where we are and whatever. So, but yeah, I, I'm really content with my quality of life now. Um, except with the movie, two, those two movies happening, travel more and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I'm comfortable with the place I'm at in life right now. 
Cool. Well, that's, you know, that's one of the things that, that you get the chronology that some the, one of the beauties of chronology is there is a, a depth of contentment that comes even after, you know, um, uh, everything else. And you, re and you reval re reevaluate your priorities also. Yeah. Perhaps at one time I was too ambitious and you know, not perhaps I was too ambitious and sacrifice family relationships and family, you know, ties and I could have done better as a father, this sort of stuff. Um, and you, you know, sort of look to try to make up some of that uh, in later life. Um, but your priorities definitely shift as you get older. To be honest. It's, yeah. 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 So I, let's talk about some of the entrepreneurial story because I do think it's very inspiring and. Um, I know that, that you've you've lived it, so some and, and you get to tell it again and again. But I do think that that there's is so, so much of it is so important for people who are, especially in this economy, so many people are thinking of pivots and uh, you know tra in transition, and they have ideas, they have they have the big you know thing that they've always wanted to do, and just. Um, I would love for you to kind of take us through just a little bit of some of your 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 the entrepreneurial journey, starting with the club that you first opened, and then the first limelight, and just give us you know, a little. I, this guy actually started with a uh, jeans shop in Cornwall. In you know, Cornwall, you know, it's a little mill town, and in you know, give or take, nineteen seventy when I opened it, seventy one, whatever it was. Um, <clears throat> the retailers in that town were you know all older guys that you know. Own their family stores for years. You, you couldn't buy bell bottoms in Cornwall, right? And those guys didn't know the difference between a bell bottom and an elephant pant. And to all the kids back then, that was really important. So I started off in the jean business. I, I, basically, I lost my eye at, at six years old, and from that, I got a, a, a an award of fifteen thousand when I was uh, sixteen or so. So, so anyway, I used that to open up a clothing store. From a clothing store, selling jeans. I bought a dilapidated country and western place in in Cornwall that they had the toughest mill crowd, whatever. <clears throat> Changed the name, transformer over the weekend, and my opening act was Rush. And that's you know, Rush. Yeah. That was one rush where nobody, I paid him a thousand dollars a week. I used to come to Toronto, which is about three hundred miles from Cornwall, every Sunday and Monday to you know, watch the bands and local clubs there and then book them for my club in in Cornwall. So anyway, Rush was my opening act, and I was paying them a thousand bucks a week. Crazy. From there, I went to you know in 1976, rock clubs or live entertainment clubs. You know, there's there's a transfer transformation into uh, dance or disco, whatever you wanted to call it back yeah. then. Yeah. Billboard magazine were doing their first uh, national disco conference in New York City. I'd never been in New York, so anyway, yeah, you know, I'm looking at my billboard and decide to go to New York. Go to New York. And they picked up a New York Times, picked up a New York Times under business opportunities. It describes this club in Florida, you know, six hundred thousand dollar light system, you know, four hundred thousand sound system. Went on and on, selling price four hundred thousand. Anybody looking at that would have said there's something wrong with this picture. Right. <laughs> uh, but I got on the next flight and, and went to Miami. The place was in Chapter Eleven, on the verge of bankruptcy, and you know we made a deal, and and then I made a deal with guys who were the exports about finance the lease of my sound and light systems. Which was a two million dollars back then, and uh, you know, went back to Florida, and you know, at a very young age, I think it was twenty two or twenty three, at you know one of the largest clubs in uh, in Florida, if not the uh, you know America. Wow! And so from there, I went to Atlanta three years later, and then New York, and then Chicago and London in eighty five. And this was when AIDS had hit New York really, you know, uh, really hard, and yeah. just putting it mildly. Yeah. And then in 90, I opened up uh, Palladium Club USA in uh, the tunnel in New York and had still had the limelight pulled you know, from 83 on. And, and you describe something that I think is really important for people when they're building anything, um, which is that y you were always hiring people who do things that you couldn't do because you didn't have time to learn the things that you didn't know how to do. And I, I, can you speak on that a little bit? Listen, you know, the, the, one thing, that, and I think it served me well over the years, is I always, I always knew what I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And I believe in experts. I really do. If somebody focuses their life on, on whatever it is, whether it's on lighting or whether on sound or on decor or on, on furniture or on this, they're the experts on it. And I'm going to listen. And, and, and um, you know, I ran the clubs pretty well by, by committee. But the committees, you know, the com committees were, you know, far ranging. Like, oh, at the limelight, we had rock and roll church Sundays that lasted for, you know, literally 10 years and Pearl Jam and, and 
Guns N' Roses and the director, you know, they all perform there for, for basically, you know, not a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, then I had Tuesday was a goth thing. Wednesday was a gay thing. You know, uh, Saturday, you know, Friday was hip hop. So basically, you know, every, every, every one of those nights had their experts. And, you know, I relied on, on, on uh, you know, on, on, their, uh, on their advice a lot. Uh, and you have to. Um, but, yeah, you have to believe in experts. Yeah. And, and I, I know that it's kind of just second nature to you, but you have a keen intuitive kind of um, thing that both in, in hiring your teams and also like, you know, well, yeah. finding I mean, music to, acts. Yeah, and- yeah. I, mean, I mean, I had a sense of, of style, but you know, in, in, you know, it, my best quality, I think, is, is that I'm a, I'm a pretty good shepherd of talent. Like, I mean, I'll be the talent, you know, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't, I can't write, I can't do a lot of things, but you know what? I'm a good shepherd of talent, and when, you know, when I see it, uh, I, I you know try to shepherd in the right directions. I try to make it financially sustainable because you know a lot of people have like uh, great ideas or, or whatever. But and I used to say to the staff, like, listen, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the execution that counts. Yep. Okay, so how do we execute this? To make it financially viable. That is, you know, we're not blowing ten thousand dollars to do something on a night that's on the night's only going to take an eight thousand dollars or something like that. You, you, know, you have to. And whether the whole creative scene, whether it's hip hop, music, art, fact, you have to make it financially sustainable. You don't have to make a score a home run on, on everything that you do, but you have to make it financially stable. It's, it's, you, know, uh, you have to make it financially viable. Otherwise, it's, it's going to die. Yep. Profit. The real, the reality of everything. Can't be too cool for school and you can't be too commercial that you're corny. It's a fine line to walk. Yeah, it's it's the it's that you know right at the 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 center, the nucleus of culture, and I mean right. I think that um, there's so many in the startup culture of the millennial generation, which is uh, the, uh, so many kind of young entrepreneurs have gotten a lot of money, and they and they kind of you know don't know what to do with it. We work is a great example. This guy who just um, right. uh, basically you know <laughs> I don't know if you read all of that going on last. Um, fall but you know he got a lot a lot of money and then mismanaged it opened a bunch of these co-working spaces and this kind of thing and i, do- I mean you, know, you got to sustain growth also you know you have to have the right you know people it, it you know acquiring places and things are not that difficult it's managing this that's the hard part yeah this is, you know, the support structure you know there to to make it work it's like you know uh, it's not easy and in, in terms of finan- uh, financials, uh, w- was that something innate to you that you that you kind of were able to run numbers and know your numbers very easily? Or yeah, I, I, you know, to be honest with you, yeah, I, I can add in, in, in whatever in my mind you know, pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm pretty decent, even, you know, even though I would not, you know, it's not like I have a business degree or anything like that. Um, yeah, I, you know, basically, you know, and a lot of it's all basically common sense. You know, you just, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, and you know, your every industry is very competitive, so you've got to be good at what you do. It's, it's not like you know anybody has a market on anything unless you've got a patent on something. But you certainly nobody has a patent on, on creating culture. No. So yeah, you know, it um, takes a lot of focus. Who did you uh, were you highly um, involved in the financial aspect in terms of of like what numbers did you have to know every day to run your businesses? Well, you have to know what you take in and what you spend. I mean, it's that's, basically that's it. two, yeah, it's two yeah. sides of a ledger. You yeah. know? And obviously you can't spend more than what you take in. And you, did you uh, know those numbers real time? Were you just like, was that something? Well, yeah, you, you, yeah, you know in real time. You know, if a night will say you know, has the potential of doing fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, so you know, you know the staff that you need to make that work, and you know, and all that goes behind it. Everything from the invites to the the mail room to the promotion of it to the invite that was designed for the for the procuring of the party for all that kind of stuff. You know, everything's got a cost type thing, and obviously your budget for a a uh, uh, it will say a Tuesday night, which is not nearly as busy. You know, you can't have the same budget that you have on a, a Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. So, you, you know, but it, you, you gain that through experience. I, I mean, I'm often asked the question like you're, um, you know, in the book, I make it clear. Like, you know, I, um, I never party in my places. Okay. I've you know, made the mistake. The first club I owned places packed for three weeks. I'm drinking. I'm not, you know, not, not, like drunk on the floor type thing, but I, I'm not paying real attention. Right. Three weeks, my checks start bouncing. And I looked around and said, well, the place is full. 
<laughs> okay, well, yeah, how are my checks bouncing? From that point on, yeah, I, I really, and I was a young kid, you know, just so, so you know what, you're, you're in the service business here. Um, you you got to look at, you know, into all details and, and money makes things sustainable. So, you, you know, you have to, you know, has to be there. Otherwise, you can't make payroll and you can't buy alcohol and you can't pay for bands and this and that, whatever. Yep. So, um, anyway, um, I don't know if that answers the question. No, no it's, you know, I'm always curious about this stuff because it, it, the people that know their, you know, like Lou Wasserman of Universal Studios, he got three numbers on his desk every morning and that's how he ran that empire. And I think that, you know, my experience as a young entrepreneur who didn't go to business school is that nobody, it's, it's, it's pragmatic and common sense, but nobody in, that's running P&Ls and all these CPAs and people who have business consultants and people who have business degrees, nobody can explain numbers to me the way that I understand the common sense of them the way that you're describing it I think it's it's actually it seems simple to you but you would be surprised and I'm sure maybe not in the world of business that you know there's all this jargon and bullshit and P&Ls but nobody really knows how much money is going in and out basically unless well, you do I, I, yeah I, I it, you know I was medium-sized business medium you know yeah you know, being a fairly big number or whatever so um but even the, you know, the money part of it, I remember when I had the clubs in, in London and Chicago and I would go in once a one week a month and the staff would, you know, show me everything that was going on and that kind of stuff. But I never really got a sense of what was happening. And, and, you know, and every day I would get from the, you know, the clubs out in the city, I would get a, a readout, like we did 2,200 people last night and, you know, the bar was this and bar, but, but it gave me no idea of, okay, that, you know, did we have to, throw the people out at 4.30 in the morning because they were having, having such a good time or were they just going through all the motions at night, right. just dancing and then out at 2.30 or whatever. So it was really important, at least in my, my kind of business, you've got to be there to get a sense of, of the vibe and are you doing it right. You just can't do it from, you know, uh, uh, reading a reading a, a, a sheet, you know, uh, of, of, of the uh, prior day's sales or whatever. Right. It's, it's really one of those hands-on businesses if you want to, create a legacy yeah um, no it's not a, it's not a, a hamburger or whatever whatever we did in london was not the same thing we did in new york and and, and nor was the same thing in chicago every market has their own uh their, their own traits and and uh you got to be sensitive to them and uh you got to be there at least in my business yeah, no, I think any anything, I mean, the, what is a, a major commodity now in the technological age, as it as it always has been, but I think even more now, is is true experience, like people right. having true experience, and, and it does, it requires a, a pulse on things that, that right. are, you know, that you have to be in real life for. Um, yeah. That's how it's created, but uh, w w what... Who do you think, I mean, when you look around right now, because I know you, you really keep a, you, I know you keep a, a sharp eye on, on current events and all that kind of thing. What do you think, I mean, do you think anyone in any sector, anyone stand out to you as a real culture creator that you would point to right now? Yeah, you know, anybody that's a prominent musician, you know, anybody who's a prominent artist, yeah, I mean, they're all cultural creators. Do I think anybody's doing in the club world right now? Uh, there's some good stuff happening a little bit in Brooklyn. There's, place, you know, there's a couple places there that, you know, on smaller scale than I was doing, uh, really work hard at, 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 you know, one of the places, a place called House of Yes. They, they put a lot of effort into, and yeah, you know, I, I met with them and they well, flat out said, listen, you are such an inspiration to us. We're just trying to create what you did, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult now. Like I said, it's just, uh, between social media, overzealous law enforcement, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's just it's just, it's a difficult world to be. I mean, we one of the things I'm most satisfied about my whole career in the nightclub is, is we put so much effort into drawing a diverse clientele. Where you got to understand, in the '80s and '90s, LBGT, call it tolerance, acceptance, yeah, you know, it was not what it is, you know, now type thing. Yeah, and we put a lot of effort, you know, to get. All those people in our roof on the same night, and and you you know you could have had guys from Brooklyn, whatever, for years hated gays or this or that, whatever. All of a sudden they're partying with them, and you know what? These people aren't so bad, and they're a lot of fun, and then you know they keep coming back every week and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, and same thing with the hip hop crowd, whatever. I mean, we 
And I, I think that's a lot of the heat that I took from Giuliani is that I was beginning to mainstream uh, the LBGT community, yeah. the club key community, the hip hop community, which we were, we thrived at the tunnel and, and whatever. And I think Giuliani looked at this here and said, you know what, we're not having, you know, this is at the time we understand he's, he's, he's trying to defund Brooklyn museum because yeah. they had a, you know, a, a topless Madonna. It's when he, you know, he, chase all the artists that were selling their stuff out of the Met or whatever. I just think people that we were catering to, which were New Yorkers, uh, wasn't what he wanted to be mainstreamed in, in New York. You know, that's not the people he cared about. He didn't care about, you know, drag queens and, and hip hop people and black people and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was mainstreaming it and, and I'm really proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it's, it's activism. I mean, I know, I, I don't know if you were thinking of it that way, but it's a whole different way of activism. It's real life activism. Where oh, you're... Yeah. Listen, I, I, yeah, I've been experiencing all those crowds, you know, for the, my whole time in nightclubs and, and I saw, you know, how happy they were and, and how great they were and how much they contributed to parties and whatever. And I, I wanted other, you know, normal straights often that don't find venues or milieus or whatever to, to associate or, or see these people or whatever, you know, all of a sudden they're thrown in the same cauldron and, and everybody loved it and they you know, lasted for 20 years. Um, the, um, the community. Yeah, and, and, you know, and I, was, I always wanted to be a microcosm of New York City, which meant every race, every gender, every you know, style, every whatever is, is part of that city. And, and I wanted to make it part of my nightclub, not just so, you know, a bunch of waspy, you know, uh, executives from Wall Street blowing thousands of dollars in my place, but who cares? There's no culture in that. There's no legacy in that. Um, and, yeah. uh, and I think that's changed a lot. Like I said, there are no clubs now where you can see like a, a, a real a real cross-section of, of cultures that, that, you know, and that make New York so terrific. It, yeah, it's 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 so rare. And I, I, I you do talk about being in the right place at the right time. But I don't think, you know, I don't think that that is random. I do feel that ultimately, even if you weren't conscious at the time, th these things are, it, it, there's a, there's a soul kind of, I would describe it maybe in a more spiritual sense, but there's a kind of hyper, hyper synchronicity of destiny. Did you feel that like that flow state when you were kind well, of, I don't know if I ever felt that, but what, what I felt like is like, so what, what we created over the many years in, in New York, you know, had to be in a market like New York or like London or Chicago where the creative community is really there. I mean, you know, we've done this in Cleveland, no disrespect to Cleveland or Cincinnati or, or Houston or whatever. I don't think so. Right. You know, right. You know, so when you say right time, right place, uh, you know, you could pull it off in, in major markets, um, but, you know, in, in sort of secondary markets, it's just not, they, they'll, there's just not the support system, you know, there to, to make it work uh, and make it financially viable. But still, you're, you, I, I, I want to know, do you, do you, I mean, did you have kind of the, the prickles down the spine or the. Oh, yeah. Listen, you know, anytime, like, you know, you'd stand on a balcony you know, and I always did it in the shadows. Like I, I was not, a, not, I was never a Steve Rubell. Yeah. And you know, not the Steve Rubell. I just. My personality is not one to be the hostess with the most. It's yeah. just small town Canadian kid. You know, I probably didn't have that confidence uh, or whatever. I, but I get gratification of, of watching 3,000 people throw their arms up in the air and, and dancing for, for hours on end and then you know, watching them leave the door and, and, and everybody taking phone numbers and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, or, or breaking acts, like yeah, I remember Pearl Jam performing, or Jay Z performing, or that kind of stuff. I mean, crowds going, you know, crazy. Yeah, you know, yeah. Of course, I felt that prickly whatever up my my spine. Um, was was it a club promoter that brought Jay Z the first time, or did you did you? No, no, it happened. No, it happened with Jay Z and everything. Whether it was Rock and Roll Sunday or, or whatever nights, they they sort of all started organically where we started doing hip hop night on, on Sundays. And then as it grew, then the artists, they would come, but then it, it developed into the night was so important that all the artists, and I mean, all of them, I mean, we're talking Jay-Z, Mary Jo Blige, Puffy, Nas, Biggie Smalls, Tupac. I mean, yeah, you can go on and on and on would all perform there on, and, so, and more than one, like Jay-Z must perform there at least six times, but yeah, 
the director, the, the guy I'm working with, uh, Sasha Jenkins, and I hadn't really, really thought about that way, but he told me, he said, Peter, you understand what you were doing back then? I said, this was like the Ed Sullivan show to the black community, where Ed Sullivan, you know, introduced the Beatles and he introduced uh, the Who and he introduced Doors and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, to the black community, if you were accepted and performed on Sunday nights, okay, it was like uh, a springboard to your career. It was yeah. like being on the Ed Sullivan show to that community. Yeah. And even I was talking, I, I did an interview the other day with a DJ Who kid. He's got his own radio show. And he was telling me, you know, he spun that tunnel and he said he remembers the first time his name was on a flyer. And in his mind, like he had just made it, man. Like, yeah. I, I'm on a tunnel flyer. So that community, it was really important. And the same thing with the rock and roll church. It started like local rock and roll bands. And then the night got a really cool industry vibe. And, and when a Pearl Jam would come to New York and they, you know, their agents wanted them to play bigger rooms, whether it was Roseland or whether it was, uh, you know, uh, Madison Square Garden or whatever. And they would say flat out now. Yeah. And it's much less a payday at my clubs because they were, they were smaller. In fact, right. hip hop community, I didn't pay any of them. The people at Pearl Jam, we would have at best maybe picked up their expenses. Right. Um, but the night had a vibe in it that was like really important. And, you know, the VIP room up there and every night, they, you know, they're on Duran or, or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Page or, or you know, Robert Plant. I mean, there's, there's that kind of action. So the vibe attracted the acts and they played in a venue that they were often way too big to play with, play for. But um, it was, like I said, you know, it was a lot of energy and, and experts in my rock and roll staff that we created that night. And in, in the yogic science, we would call that, that uh, basically these things are held in your aura. So the, 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 in some way, though, you may not be directly related to when you, when you've created something, it's, it's your aura, it's your energy field. That well, it, yeah, I, I was you know, integral to it, but I didn't do it by myself for sure. I was, you know, I was, you know, I was a big piece of the puzzle making it work for sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, who are you, who, who's, who's some, you know, who are the people that ended up becoming lifelong friends? Like the, these people that are coming through any of the, the, um, you know, those people ended up becoming. Well, you know, friends. back to like, and this is, you know, it was, it was not my forte. When, when so, you know, I, celebrities would come in the club and they came in almost every night. I would, you know, if I was up, up front door, but I'd introduce myself and went, but that was it. You know, they'd be, they'd go in on their own. You know, if they were with friends, they probably knew some of the VIP room upstairs or whatever. And again, I get gratification out that you know nobody ever came to my clubs to hang out with Peter Gation. Right. Okay? They just didn't. They came right. because of the package, the production, the event, the night, the whatever that my group put together. All right. Yeah. They weren't coming up there to hang out at the bar with Peter and you know, and whatever. You know. Uh, this wasn't the case. So you know, if I got professional relations with some of these people, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's not like. Yeah, I got to know Warhol better than a lot of them because we met out to dinner probably half a dozen times, that kind of right, stuff. Right. But it wasn't, you know, I was not a hobnobber with the, with the, you know, yeah. uh, jet set or that kind of stuff. I, I was, I was, you know, I was in the shadows. You're busy. <laughs> You're busy. busy. And, and truthfully, they were coming there to, to have a good time and whatever. And, you know, me hanging off, you know, sitting at their couch or whatever. Uh, wasn't going to enhance their experience. I, you know, I want them to you know, experience the club, not experience, you know, you know like two hours with me. Yeah, yeah. Well put. Um, so let's talk about uh, Giuliani and that whole uh, situation for a minute. I mean, do you, obviously, um, there was, you know, agendas and, and, and that kind of thing. I mean, how deep do you think uh, Juliana's agenda went in terms of him going after you and... and... It, 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 there was no balance. And, and that's why I ended up being deported. Yeah. We kept winning. What happened with Giuliani, you know, there's the thing that he didn't want what I was doing to be mainstreamed. And I think also... Um, he ran out of squeegee people. I got to remember, he started off with his you know, quality of life campaign, went after the squeegee people, ran out of them. And I think he looked at around and said, who's vulnerable? And I, when I say, and this is not me being pompous, what I was the face of nightlife. Like I had owned the four largest clubs in town. Yep. Uh, we got national press, international press, local press, 
you know, week in, week out. Um, and they just looked at me and, and figured, okay, he's a mega maniac, and then let's go after this guy. And I kept winning in court. I mean, I was financially being destroyed as, as the, you know, the attack intensified. Yeah. And, you know, and I won at the federal court level. Federal court, the feds win 95% of the cases. I was acquitted in three hours. Okay. Wow. Um, five week trial. So I didn't win on technicality or anything like that. And actually, after I beat that one, then, they, you know, city kept sending in like 50, and I'm not exaggerating, you know, 50, 60 narcs. They closed us down ex parte. We'd go to the court. The judge would say, you know, Mr. Gation's doing everything we can here. Da, da, da. So this went on and on for about three years after my, two years after my acquittal, 98 to, to 2000. And, and it, it was just nonstop closing us down. I was, I was financially hemorrhaging. And then they finally threw the, uh, the INS at me and I would have won that case, but it would have been in a detention center for a year and a half to two years. And I think people are a little more familiar with the conditions in detention centers now with all the yeah. kids in cages and the atrocities that are happening there. Um, I was in one for six weeks and, and basically I threw up the white flag. It's just no way I'm going to be here for you know, a year and a half waiting for my hearing date. So I came back to Canada. Um, but guys like him, you know, and, 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 and people may have not given me the benefit of doubt if I written this, this book five years ago, right. but I think now with all the stuff that Giuliani has done with Ukraine and all that kind of stuff, the, you know, the man is just a piece of, of you know, of, of shit is another yeah. way to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I, I think uh, many of the people listening to this might not understand what uh, Giuliani, like how, what he single-handedly did um, to New York. I mean, I guess there was some benefit, but uh, I mean, he was on a rampage. Yeah. No, it, it, listen, in New York, it, it, and I was still there in 2001, just prior to that, the city was sick of Giuliani. He had, he had, he had, he uh, there's that Diallo kid that gotten like shot 20 times in, in, in front of his house. There's other one that uh, an art tried to buy drugs from a guy that didn't sell drugs and ended up even shooting. And Giuliani released uh, the kid's criminal record, even though he was a juvenile. He was, you know, put out there, this guy's a little older. Point is, the city was sick of Giuliani before 9 yeah. 11. And then he was able to rebrand himself. And, and you know, he is what he is today. Um, but he's a megalomaniac, and uh, um, I, you know, I definitely, uh, I was in his, uh, in, in, in his fire, and he's the kind of guy that doesn't like to lose, and yeah. uh, I kept beating. Yeah, yeah, I was just uh, watching something, you know, on on more, I guess, would be termed conspiracy theory, but I, I don't think it is, um, where this woman, her name is Carrie Cassidy, was just talking about j explaining to the world that that if somebody is being gone after or they're being threatened for jail time and, you know, this kind of stuff, or maybe they've they've spent time in jail, um, not always, but many times those pe they, they're, you know, if they're doing something like legacy if they're really doing culture shifting or they're truth tellers those are the people that are are doing the good work and the people who are put up on the on the pedestals and given the awards and this kind of stuff are the ones that are you know up to no good but people don't look at it that way yeah basically i, I i'm so offended by these holier than thou people like giuliani if you remember right in new york at the time when he's basically going after and and, and whether it's a museum whether it's artist or whatever you know he's having an affair on his wife and, and, you know, in city hall and, 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 but that's cool for, you know, people like him don't have rules. Same thing. Right. stuff you know, all that nonsense he did in, in Ukraine, people like him don't have rules. Those were you, know, you and I and the lessers. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's why I had no reason I think he didn't like my clubs. Like I said, I had clientele that were people in his opinion are unworthy of, of existing almost, whether it's gays, whether it's drag queens, whether it's hip hop people, black people, yeah. Latino, whatever. They just yeah. don't like them. Um, so, uh, well, I would l thank you so much for just, uh, 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 spending time with us and, and, um, just talking about your incredible, um, legacy and, um, I, uh, am really quite excited to see this. Amazon Jen's been telling me about, um, what's yeah. happening well, in that and what I'm very excited. Yeah. I know it's going to be a little while. She's the one who's been driving it. You know, she, um, I, she does all the credit. 
Yeah, it's 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 going to be really good. And this book, I just highly recommend it to everyone. It's a really incredible book. And I want I, I if I have any say in it, you should write more. You're an incredible writer. Thank you. Really uh, amazing. And um, I tried to find you on Instagram, but I'm guessing you don't do social media. Is there a way? Would you do any social media? Well, basically, you know, the book's on Instagram right now. Okay. Um, you know, you know, it's available in audio, uh, Kindle, uh, hardback, you know, uh, paperback. You just go to Amazon.com, you know, the Club King, um, and uh, believe it or not, it's number one. Uh, it's number one in uh, memoirs right now on Amazon. I believe it. It's it's really it, it's uh, it's excellent, and you're an excellent writer. Um, can we find you? Is it does the book have an Instagram account? Yeah, Club King. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and and uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing more about um, the the Amazon and also this documentary on on the tunnel. I'm 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 a huge fan of um, hip hop, particularly uh, old school hip hop. So I can't wait to to see what happens with that. And thanks for spending some time with us. Okay, it was my pleasure. And, and you know, anytime you know, call me. It so, was fun. so great to meet you. And I hope I hope to meet you in person. Yeah, we will. We will. Okay. Yeah, as soon as all this is over, and hopefully it'll be yeah this summer at the latest. Yeah, yeah. And what w- one of these days I have to pick your brain because I I have a festival um, that uh, I think is very culture creating, and so well m- maybe when we get yeah, a chance, I'd love, to, I'd love to talk to you about it. Yeah, I would love to as well. All right, take care. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Reality Riffing. These are conversations that I think are important with people who are doing great things in the world about subject matters that need to be discussed. If you enjoyed the content, the conversation, please feel free to share with your people, share with your friends and family, rate the podcast below and also subscribe.